Well, welcome to our webinar. We are incredibly happy to have you. Um, this is the Cultural Expression in Indigenous Art and Design. I'm Lauren Van Schilfgaard, an assistant professor here at the UCLA School of Law, and we're so pleased that you can join us for our event celebrating Native American Heritage Month. Um, I first would like to acknowledge the uh, Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, or the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands, which is where I'm sitting right now at the UCLA School of Law. We are incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarhaxatum or the indigenous peoples of this place. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to Hanukvatum or the ancestors, Ahihirum, the elders, and Iohinkim, our relatives and relations past, present, and those emerging. I am incredibly honored to introduce our star-studded panel for this event. Up first, we have Professor Angela Riley. She's a citizen of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and a professor of law and American Indian studies here at UCLA. She is special advisor to the Chancellor on Native American Indigenous Affairs and directs UCLA School of Law's Native Nations Law and Policy Center. She is also the director of the joint JD and MA degree in Law and American Indian Studies. She's chaired the UCLA Campus Repatriation Committee since 2010. Her research focuses on indigenous people's rights with a particular emphasis on cultural property and native governance. In addition to her own tribe, Supreme Court, she currently sits as the appellate justice at the Rincon Band of Luiseno Indian Courts of Appeal and at the Pakagan Band of Potawatomi Indians Court of Appeals. She received her undergraduate degree at the University of Oklahoma and law degree at Harvard Law School. Second, we'll be featuring Professor Sonia Katyal. Her work focuses on the intersection of technology, intellectual property, and civil rights, including anti-discrimination, privacy, and freedom of speech. Professor Katyal's current projects focus on artificial intelligence and intellectual property, trademark law, branding and advertising, the intersection between the right to information and human rights, and a variety of projects on the intersection between art law, cultural heritage, and new med media. Professor Katyal also works on matters regarding law, gender, and sexuality. During the Obama administration, Katyal was selected by the U.S. Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker to be part of the inaugural U.S. Commerce Department's Digital Economy Board of Advisors. Um, she is a graduate of Brown University and the University of Chicago Law School. Finally, in this star-studded event, Professor K Kristen Carpenter, who is the Council Tree Professor of Law and Director of the American Indian Law Program at the University of Colorado. Professor Carpenter was appointed to the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as its member from North America from 2017 to 2021. She currently serves as a justice for the Shawnee Tribal Supreme Court and is co-lead of the implementation project regarding the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples here in the United States with colleagues at the Native American Rights Fund. She is a graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Riley, who will start off our presentations, after which we will have a uh, portion for question and answers. So please feel free to submit any of your questions in the uh, Zoom Q&A box, and we will attempt to get to what we can after the presentations. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lauren, and good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Um, with my esteemed colleagues and friends. Um, we've been writing together for probably over 15 years. And one of the earliest pieces that we did actually with the three of us co-authoring was in the realm of cultural property, um, where we talked about a variety of cultural property uh, aspects, including intangible. And a lot has happened since then. And so we're excited to bring this event to you. Um, we're gonna sort of focus on various aspects of what's happening with the intersection between IP and indigenous people's traditional knowledge sort of writ large. And we'll break that down a little bit in the presentation. I want to start by sharing my screen. So let me see, hopefully that's working fine. Uh, I wanted to start by giving a little bit of background on what we're talking about when we talk about the protection of intangible property. I'm gonna ground this in the United States law conversation because really it's become the predominant conversation around the world 
although the projects that are happening at the international level, at the United Nations, in the World Intellectual Property Organization, which I've been heavily involved in, and so has Professor Carpenter, um, among many other people, um, really talk about this in slightly different terms, using terms like traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions and genetic resources. But I'm gonna to stick to the US model for right now because Professor Carpenter is gonna pick up on some of the international aspects at the end. So within the US, when we talk about the protection of intangible property or IP, intellectual property, we're talking about things that usually fall into one of three buckets. The big categories being copyright, patent, and trademark. And we're very fortunate to have Professor Katyal here with us today, who's one of, in one of the country's leading IP scholars and trademark scholars in particular. Most things that are protected under intellectual property law in the U.S. are going to fall within one of these three categories. So to give you a very, uh, at a very high level of generalization, patents are usually for inventions. Copyright protects things that are creative expressions like designs, songs, stories, novels, movies, etc. And trademark is used to signify brands, Nike, Coca-Cola, etc., that are used in commerce. There are some other uh, intellectual property rights that are at work in the U.S. system. Oftentimes, these are based in the common law and may be more relevant at the state level rather than the international level. So what we've seen with the intersection of intellectual property and indigenous people's expressions over you know, many, many years, and I, I think I published my first article on this topic in 1999 or something around there, it's well documented that it's a poor fit between indigenous people's intellectual property and the laws that protect that property in the US system. So just to give a really kind of simplistic example with copyright, for example, you have to have a work of authorship that is original and fixed in a, in a, um, and fixed in a fixed medium of expression in order for it to receive copyright protection. So when we talk about things like ceremonies, songs, designs, intergenerational creations in indigenous communities where you can't really identify one or even a necessarily specified group of authors where information and knowledge has been passed down since time immemorial or at least for generations and generations. So the authorship component in and of itself is, is virtually impossible to meet. The originality also can be very difficult because again, if these are creations that are alive within the community and are communal in nature and have existed within the community for a long time, you have um, a difficulty in demonstrating the originality piece of it. And fixed in a tangible medium of expression, similarly, when you're talking about communities that engage in oral tradition, and most things haven't been written down for many, many years until recently, uh, or documented in some other way, you also have a bad fit there. So this is true of various aspects of intellectual property law and indigenous people's um, intangible cultural property. So what we find in the contemporary world as more and more of the value of property that we see in society and in trade and commerce and in creativity is fits within the intangible arena or the intellectual property arena, we find indigenous peoples oftentimes losing out on the protections that could help them both to keep things within the community that they desire not to be distributed, but also to perhaps market their own work in a way that is authentic and true to them. I just want to give a few examples of intellectual property um, cases that have come up. There aren't that many reported cases out there, in part because I think a lot of these cases, once they're raised, they do settle. So, But we have a few examples that have had prominence in recent years. This is a, a relatively high-profile case involving the Navajo Nation and Urban Outfitters. Um, Urban Outfitters, the retailer, was promoting things like Navajo Nation panties and Navajo Nation, not Nation, but Navajo panties and Navajo flasks and other items that it was marketing as Navajo. And there was a lawsuit involving the appropriation of the name and essentially representing that these things were in some way Navajo when they were not. And that case did resolve in a settlement. A similar case that was relatively high profile involved the Crazy Horse Malt Liquor. This is a case where a company, which at the time was the company that owned Snapple, was um, marketing malt liquor to a reservation community using the Crazy Horse name, uh, even though the, the company was actually operating technically outside of reservation boundaries, 
the, the core of the litigation that actually went up to the Eighth Circuit was the question of whether the tribal court could have jurisdiction over the case, which ultimately the Eighth Circuit said they could not. But there was still ongoing litigation around the use of Crazy Horse's name. Crazy Horse, of course, was a revered Lakota leader and was a, a leader who was opposed to the use of alcohol, having seen the damage it had done to his people. And um, it was particularly blasphemous for this, uh, for his name and likeness to be used in this way. And ultimately, his descendants brought suit. And you can see on the slide that they did some creative things, including using Lakota law in their claims. And then ultimately, what, the, what they were seeking for in the settlement was a variety of things that were not particularly um, typical in the Western system. They were not really monetarily focused, but but both in terms of reparations, making things right, and also stopping the use of the name. And then the final example I want to give is a, a case that I was um, involved in, involving the Quileute. If any of you watched the Twilight movies or read the books, you know that um, one of the one of the big structures and one of the big themes of the book is that there's a love triangle between a human girl and a vampire and a werewolf. And the werewolf is um, supposedly a Quileute Indian who uh, lives on a reservation where the all the tribal members supposedly descended from werewolves. Stephanie Meyer, who wrote the books, uh, never got permission from the Quileute, never worked with them or really collaborated with them in any way. These ended up being an international phenomenon, and some of the parties ended up doing some of the marketing from the success of the books and the movies, marketing things like this choker that you can see here where they call it a Quileute choker and using essentially appropriating the tribe's name. Uh, so as these cases have arisen, and there again, there are many, many, many more examples I'm sure that you could think of that are out there. These are just three high profile examples. The question arises, is intellectual property well suited to do much here? And um, if so, what could it possibly do? So let me just shift a little bit to one of the features of US law that is specifically intended to target this issue. And that's the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. This was originally passed in the 1930s in order to protect Indian artisans from a massive influx of false uh, products into the marketplace. And as many of you out there are well aware, if you're in indigenous communities or even had exposure with indigenous communities, there is so much unbelievable creativity, innovation, and beautiful work that comes out of tribes in the US and around the world. Techniques that have been passed down for hundreds of years in weaving, silversmithing, uh, jewelry making, so many different aspects. And the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was intended to protect these um, artisans in part by acting as a truth in advertising law. So essentially it says you can't promote your work as Indian made unless it actually is Indian made. Um, and that's true for tribal names too. You can't say something is Potawatomi made unless it's actually Potawatomi made. We've seen, um, I think in recent years, such an escalation in incredible indigenous design in all kinds of realms, in film and movie and music, um, and also in fashion, which Professor Carpenter will talk more about at the end. And Professor Katyal is gonna talk about what the US law looks like with regard to protection for fashion design. Um, but what we've also seen is a lot of fraudulent um, material coming into the marketplace. There are proposals right now to amend the Indian Arts and Crafts Act that would do a few things. And again, these are still on the table, so we don't know exactly how it will all end up shaking out. But it wants to, in theory, a few things will happen. One, it would expand the definition of Indian products. So change that a little bit to account for some of the innovations and in technology and products that are being created using you know, new technologies that didn't exist even 10 years ago. It also would allow for some non-Indian labor in products. This is somewhat controversial, but what we have seen are Native artisans, for example, who want to produce something that they've designed and created on a larger scale. And they themselves can't make every single ribbon skirt or every single, you know, whatever it is, piece of, uh, you know, pair of earrings. So how much can you use non-Indian labor and have it still fit within the definition of Indian in the, art, in the Indian Arts and Crafts Act? There are provisions to allow Native Hawaiians, uh, Native Hawaiian organizations to be included. And also there's talk of a new certification trademark. So an actual mark that could be used for a designation. 
Um, one of the things that I want to just touch on before I turn the floor over is I've spent a lot of time researching tribal law in this area, and I have an article out there that was published in 2022 called The Ascension of Indigenous um, and I think it's the ascension of indigenous cultural property law. If you're interested in it, it talks about a lot of these things, but it talks about the examples that I found in my research that are active at the tribal level. And because the rest of our presentation will focus on national and international law, I want to take a moment to refer to some of the tribal law innovations because tribes are legislating and codifying law in this space and doing some really innovative things. I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, this is a tribe that is putting into place a law that's very similar to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, but it's specific to their own tribe. So there, um, you can see from the ordinance, it allows tribal members to identify the item as X crafted. I just used X as a generic for the tribe here as defined below. So here, this is essentially operating like an Indian Arts and Crafts Act, but, but specifically at the tribal level. Here's another example that I think is really interesting where the tribe keeps um, some control over what can be produced uh, and what can be marketed. They indicate that there are certain designs that are considered sacred and gifts from the creator and give um, have some control over what can be used in outward facing or commodifiable products that go into the stream of commerce. And then here's a, a, another example that's similar to an arts and crafts law that they're calling a truth in advertising for native arts similar to the first one I talked about. So those are just a few places, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing now. Those are just a few places that we see tribal law innovations in this space and um, a lot of exciting stuff really happening going forward and uh, to protect the intangible property of indigenous peoples. So I'll stop there and turn this over now to um, my next speaker, uh, Professor Katyal. Great. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here um, with, uh, my gosh, just people that I just adore so much um, professionally and personally. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the issues that come up with respect to intellectual property, with respect to fashion design. Um, hang on a second. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, great. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah? Okay. Um, wonderful. Well, uh, so I think Professor Riley started us off in a wonderful uh, direction by talking a little bit about some of the different uh, uh, developments that have happened in the tribal space. I'm going to actually shift back and talk a little bit about some of the obstacles that exist in, at the federal level in the United States. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit more specifically about different areas of intellectual property um, and how different areas of intellectual property kind of improperly, I would say, mesh onto some of the issues with respect to um, indigenous cultural property, um, fashion design and uh, and jewelry. So currently, uh, there are a bunch of different areas in the sort of intellectual property landscape that govern um, uh, questions, levels of protection for indigenous designs. And um, I'm gonna just kind of walk through a bunch of these. Um, what we are finding at a sort of general level, and I'm gonna talk mostly about some of these issues from a uh, non-indigenous perspective, although I definitely wanna draw folks attention to some of the, the um, issues that are coming up specifically with respect to indigenous uh, fashion and design. But in general, there's been a real recognition that intellectual property, uh, just as Professor Riley said, is really ill-fitted for um, dealing with issues of fashion, dealing with issues of indigenous art, and increasingly also dealing with issues of function. So there are a bunch of different frameworks that kind of arguably govern these areas, and I'm going to kind of walk us through a bunch of them. There's copyright law, there's trademark law, there's trade dress and product design, which is kind of a subset of trademark law. And then there are also uh, design patents, which I'm also going to talk specifically about. Um, but uh, one of the things that I think is also just really important to establish just as a general matter is that in the United States, there is generally a presumption that that fashion, fashion design cannot be copyrighted. So 
this is why we have fast fashion, slow fashion, all different kinds of um, knockoff designs in the fashion world. And that is because fashion has traditionally been viewed through the eyes of being a useful article. That is when it accomplishes a certain function, it cannot be protected under copyright law. So this extends to lots of different areas of fashion design because it performs a certain function. Now, more recently, the Supreme Court has established a particular doctrine that came from uh, questions of athletic, copyrightability of athletic uniforms. Um, and it articulated this notion of separability. And that is the idea that some elements can be protected by copyright law, but only when those elements can be separated from the useful elements of a work. So what this essentially means is that if it could be perceived as a two or three dimensional work of art separate from the useful article, or if it would get protection on its own as an object of copyright protection, then it can receive copyright protection. And so many people, many scholars felt like this particular case was the Supreme Court kind of opening the door to a more aggressive set of uh, protections for the copyrightability of fashion. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of other scholars have argued that there's really no need to offer additional protections to fashion just as a general matter, because fashion already is so time specific and already so profitable. That is an additional layer of intellectual property protection might not do that much for uh, designers. Now, both of these arguments, I would say, really overlook the particular interests and the particular concerns of indigenous communities, particularly the cases that um, Professor Riley uh, started by talking us off, um, by talking to us about. Um, so in the case that I mentioned regarding the copyrightability of athletic uniforms, the court found that the designs of the uniforms met both prongs of the test that I just outlined. The geometric designs of the um, uniforms were perceivable separate from the uniforms. And then when they were removed from this uniform context, they had designs that were applicable to them. They had the possibility of being protected as pictorial, graphic, or sculptural, work, sculptural works. So the court felt that because those designs could be separate from the elements that were useful, that it made sense for the court to open the door to protecting them. I'm now going to turn, on, turn to uh, trademark law. And one thing that we should sort of take away from the questions about copyrightability of fashion is that there is some opening for the copyrightability of fashion, but a very slim opening indeed in the wake of Star Athletica. Trademark law, um, as Professor Riley mentions, really protects a designation of source. It protects logos, labels, prints, patterns, certain types of stitching, and other colors. Um, there's a notion uh, that's a subset of trademark law that protects uh, trade dress, which is what we might refer to as the total image and appearance of a product. But under both of these requirements, they uh, have to be considered to be non-functional. And there is a distinction that is drawn between the overall appearance of a product and the actual design of a product. When something involves design, we have to be able to show something called secondary meaning, which means that it has to link directly to a specific source. The problem in many of these cases, when we think about fashion design generally, and then we think about design, particularly from the perspective of indigenous communities, is that the items have to, number one, be distinct to a particular source, and they also have to satisfy kind of a level of uniqueness or novelty such that it is associated with one particular source. And in many situations, it's very hard to kind of reach this level of protection and establish what's known of as secondary meaning, largely because often designs are community oriented, because it's hard to point to a specific source, or um, because other things have happened in the marketplace that in some ways dilute the original source distinctiveness of um, the original good. Now, as Professor Riley has mentioned, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act does a wonderful job of carving out specific delineations for um, 
the intersection of uh, tribal uh, um, tribes and uh, their uh, use of particular works, but the tribes have to be nationally recognized. There's a bunch of other requirements that are um, part of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So I'll talk about that in a moment, but I want to just delve a little bit more deeply into trade dress, which is another aspect of how things can be protected in the marketplace in terms of design and appearance. So trade dress covers the shape, size, color, color combinations, texture, graphics, um, a collection of elements that might not separately be protectable, but together can be protectable um, in the realm of uh, traditional sort of um, ways of thinking about fashion design, trade dress can extend to things like the Adidas shape design, uh, the Birkin bags designed by Arne, Arme, um, uh, Levi's, uh, the stitching on pockets. Um, but the thing that's a little hard about trade dress, again, has to do with the questions of secondary meaning and source designation that I mentioned earlier, that it's often very hard to prove or to show that the eyes of the general consumer associate a particular good with a particular source. And that's one of the big obstacles for stronger trademark and trade dress protection. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about design patents because design patents also provide us with some other avenues of support. They last for around 15 years and they cover ornamental features. So features that are ornamental as opposed to having a function in the marketplace. You can get a design patent for new original and ornamental designs um, as long as it was disclosed in a printed publication, publicly used and made available to the public. The problem, however, is that design patents do not extend to garments. So you have this world where fashion design is recognized as very powerful and a driver of the marketplace, but that actually it turns out intellectual property protections are very hard to, um, to acquire uh, in favor of indigenous communities. Let me draw you to some, uh, some non-indigenous examples of jewelry protection that have been successful in the marketplace. So one involved uh, the protection of the clover leaf feature, the clover shaped features by Van Cleef and Arpels um, that noted that the shape was common, but there was enough uniqueness to the constellation of how the shape appeared uh, to be protectable. There was another case that went the other way, however, which held that a district court, um, a district court held that the use of barbed wire jewelry was not copyrightable because it wasn't considered to be creative or original enough. Uh, and it wasn't distinguishable from actual jewelry to uh, actual barbed wire, which I found sort of interesting. But I wanted to tell you about these cases because I want you to see how unclear these principles are within a general intellectual property landscape and how even more complicated they get when we think about it from the perspective of how important it is to protect the uh, indigenous designs um, from, uh, from tribes. Now, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act makes it illegal to offer and display uh, for sale or sell any art or craft product that falsely suggests that it is Indian produced. Um, uh, there are civil and criminal penalties. Um, but as Professor Riley mentions, there's a lot of really interesting kind of um, ways that the Indian Arts and Crafts Act acts can now potentially be extended outward. The last thing that I wanna say before I turn things over to Kristen, um, is uh, that I think that what we see here is that even in the absence of strong intellectual property protections, I want to draw your attention to the fact that other jurisdictions are way more mindful about the importance of protecting Indigenous heritage, uh, particularly through the lens of collaboration and protection. So even if it doesn't rise to the level of classic intellectual property protections, there is a role for ethics, there's a role of moral considerations, and there's a role for collaboration and attribution. So one thing that I think is worthy of mentioning, right, is the fact that in Australia, you have protocol guides that look at the list of values that are articulated, respect, self-determination, communication, consultation, interpretation, cultural integrity, secrecy, attribution, benefit sharing, continuing cultures, recognition, and protection. And so I just want us, if there's one thing that I hope that folks can take away from my presentation, it's that even though intellectual property 
uh, protections may be harder to establish on a formal level. What is much easier to establish on an informal level is the role of ethics and morality in respecting and protecting the rights of indigenous peoples to receive attribution and income from their designs. And that that is a matter of ethics and morals, even if it is not as clear outside of the Indigenous Arts and Crafts Act. Thanks so much. And I'm gonna turn things over now to uh, Professor Carpenter. Thank you, Professor Riley and Professor Katyal. Um, it's great to have the band back together. And I'm reminded that you both are tough acts to follow. I would like to also share my screen. Um, and I think Professor Cowtail, that means your slides are gonna disappear and that's okay. Okay. So um, as Professor Riley and Professor Katiel mentioned, I'm going to turn to the international arena with some comparative and international examples and developments, um, especially around the issue of indigenous peoples and fashion design. I was just at the World Intellectual Property Organization with Sue Noe, with whom I direct the implementation project at the Native American Rights Fund. And we, um, had some really productive conversations that I would love to share with you here. But one framing that we might observe at the global level is that many of these conflicts arise um, at the intersection of indigenous people's self-determination and state power. And one of the um, weavers and activists whom I really respect quite a bit is featured here, Angelina Hasbrook, who's one of the leaders of the national movement of Maya weavers, um, who have sought legal protections in Guatemala for their traditional designs shown here um, in the weeple or the traditional garment of the Maya people. And she and the other weavers she's worked with um, have long talked about the problem of appropriation in that um, both local, um, national and international companies have often appropriated the designs of Maya women, which are usually put together um, collectively um, among, among women and reflects some very particular representation of the lands where they live, perhaps certain flora and fauna or designs passed along um, and techniques passed along from grandmothers and grandmothers and have historically had no protection in um, the laws of Guatemala. And they've had a number of measures, both seeking uh, national legislation to recognize collective ownership at the level of Maya Weaver collectives um, for their designs and their processes. Those legislative um, measures they've sought have not yet passed. Um, and they've also brought a number of court cases um, seeking compensation from the Guatemala national government for using their likenesses and including um, depictions of their weeple in the um, in tourism and advertising. And those claims have, have actually um, gone further than how the, um, the efforts for legislative reform. But I think what's so powerful here about this statement and many others that she's made is that um, Ms. Azpulak is uh, connecting the uh, land rights and the self-determination of the people to the expression and the struggle of women weavers, um, both in their work um, and in their culture. And she talks very powerfully about what it is that they're seeking, which is recognition of their authorship, their proprietorship, their knowledge, um, and their skills that form their, their weavings. Both Professor Katiel and Professor Riley have mentioned that um, traditional intellectual property law in the United States, and I think it's fair to say around the world, presents problems of fit for indigenous peoples in terms of the lack of collective ownership um, or authorship that IP um, typically looks for, um, as well as a number of other challenges. I think another dynamic that we could observe when we're looking at these issues globally 
is the one of geopolitics and the fact that um, the vast majority of countries in the global north have very strong systems of intellectual property rights. And this is one of, of many graphics that's available online that just depicts these dynamics. And so not only is it that indigenous peoples within countries um, like Guatemala may not have national laws, but also Guatemala itself um, and um, the industries and companies therein may also be exploited um, by global markets, global economies and um, global legal systems. And I think it's no accident that many of the indigenous people's claims, not exclusively, because of course in the US and Canada and Australia, as Sonia mentioned, there are many indigenous people seeking more legal protection. But as you look at Africa and Latin America and the Middle East and Russia and the um, Nordic countries, um, indigenous peoples there too are suffering what I think of as this multi-layered um, set of, um, of uh, oppression or subordination that um, exists in the intellectual and cultural property realm. The World Intellectual Property Organization, um, which is an independent agency of the United Nations, and as Professor Riley mentioned, um, she and I and many others before us and many others after us have been long working to address the issue of indigenous people's intellectual and cultural properties. And on the one hand, WIPO um, replicates many of the challenges I just mentioned. It's a state-centric organization and it's a state-centric organization in which those countries that are very interested in protecting industries whose um, assets are largely intellectual property, that is the United States, Canada, Japan, France, Germany, those are the countries that are really controlling WIPO to a significant extent. But it is still an international multilateral organization um, that does pay attention to human rights and um, equality and peace and security across the world. So it has become a prime venue for trying to address the, gl the global aspects of indigenous peoples, um, traditional cultural expressions, traditional knowledge and genetic resources. And I should say along those lines, Professor Riley already teed this up, but one of the potentially transformative points um, and developments in WIPO is starting to um, recognize another set of categories. So acknowledging the limitations of doctrines like copyright and trademark, which Professor Katyal just elaborated on, and also the um, holistic nature of indigenous people's um, expressions, relationship with land, arts, and design, some categories have been adopted by WIPO that try to more fully recognize those dynamics. And so, for example, instead of negotiating about copyright or trademark per se, there's a category of traditional cultural expressions. And I bolded the designs, names, signs, and symbols, which are so relevant to the conversation we've been having today, and noting that um, they, these can reflect traditional culture of indigenous peoples. They may form part of their identity. Um, they may be collectively held. They may be passed orally from generation to generation. And these um, characteristics of indigenous people's traditional cultural expressions um, need to be recognized and need to be recognized in um, legal instruments. And the WIPO process, the governmental committee, which has been in existence for 23 years, so you might say its um, progress has been somewhat slow, but it has been working to achieve text-based um, instruments for the protection of these um, important realms of culture and expression for indigenous peoples. And I'm not gonna talk too much about traditional knowledge, um, which has to do with inventions, genetic resources, which might be plant knowledge, um, but really focus my comments on traditional cultural expressions. So I've talked a bit about the state side, um, both the Maya people in Guatemala as seeking national legislation, and um, states coming together at the intellectual property organization with indigenous peoples to try to negotiate these um, legal protections. But I think there are also very interesting evolutions happening on the industry side. And both of my colleagues mentioned brands or companies that are working in the design space. And um, in the 20 or so years that I've been participating in or watching um, things develop, 
I think there has been a really uh, fascinating set of, um, I guess, dynamics. It's almost like the, the five stages of grief that companies seem to be going through. And, um, and of course, not all companies and not all countries are having this experience at the same time. But for a very long time, the norm was just appropriation. Companies thought they could appropriate Indigenous people's cultural expressions. And when Indigenous people started to bring those issues to their attention, the first response was denial. Um, this isn't something that Indigenous peoples own. It doesn't fit in the cultural property um, regime. So therefore, um, we shouldn't have to recognize it. And if anything, and this is almost my favorite worst defense, um, companies would say, well, we're inspired by Indigenous peoples. We're trying to honor them, um, but of course, honor them in a way that didn't include attribution or benefit sharing or anything else. Um, in item number three or phase number three, I mentioned liability. And of course that's um, somewhat contested because as Sonia and Angela have said, often companies have evaded liability for appropriating indigenous people's cultural expressions because of the limits of the law. But I think it's becoming increasingly clear that companies are facing other forms of liability. Um, their reputations are suffering or they're realizing actually that, that the quality and distinctiveness of their products is starting to suffer on the market. And people don't really want the generic um, Urban Outfitters, Navajo Panty. What they want in an era of increasing sophistication and information is the, um, the detailed, the evocative, the special design that is produced by an indigenous person who can talk about their um, culture. They can talk about the way their you know, auntie, um, uh, tanned the moose hide and beaded their earrings. And that creates value that customers are incredibly um, and increasingly interested in. So I think through some of those dynamics, the companies have become more aware and they have finally turned from appropriation slash inspiration to actual collaboration with indigenous designers. And you see some of that evolution in these um, headlines shown here. So if I reflect on the, what I think is the two-pronged nature of Indigenous peoples' um, search for respect of their traditional cultural expressions in the global setting, I see both the, the countryside and the company side. And I've already mentioned um, a bit about the intergovernmental committee process. I would note that it has a draft instrument, um, a 2023 instrument, and it's still a draft. I'm sure it's going to be, um, you know, seriously negotiated by states and maybe Indigenous peoples won't end up with all of these protections. But it does, like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it brings a human rights perspective um, to the protection of culture and identity. Um, it recognizes Indigenous peoples as the creators, developers, and holders of their traditional cultural expressions. And perhaps maybe even most significantly, and this goes back to Professor Riley's point about tribal law, it recognizes Indigenous people's own customs and laws as creating cognizable rights and the significance of their expressions as deriving from their own customs and laws. And the draft instrument would require some of the things that Professor Katyal talked about, um, attribution, benefit sharing, um, venues for claims of misappropriation, respect for cultural norms, um, and even the ability for indigenous peoples to distinguish between items that are sacred and secret, that's you know expressions that may be ceremonial, and those that, that are meant to be um, traded or go on the market. And then on the company side, if we um, you know, turn the page from the states or countries side, I recently attended um, a high-level dialogue at the UN among companies and indigenous peoples. And I have to say it was incredibly refreshing. The dialogue had really changed from the last time I was at WIPO. And maybe it's that companies are um, more nimble than states. Maybe it's that they're feeling pressure from markets. But um, there was great discussion among very high level um, brands there and very talented indigenous designers. And there is an emerging document that would suggest steps for collaboration between indigenous peoples and companies the five steps are noted here. And I guess to highlight a couple of them that I find very moving, um, the word relationship or relational appears twice. And I think this is such a move from the idea that 
for the practice where companies just extracted designs or extracted content, not unlike they do in the um, in the extractive industries realm, but would just extract these incredible values, um, designs, expressions. And now the idea is they realize they need to conduct research to figure out how to develop relationships with indigenous peoples. Is it through an artist collective? Is it on an individual basis? Is it through the country of origin? And then build relationships of trust, reach agreements, actually come to free prior and informed consent between indigenous designers um, and companies, give that respect, acknowledgement and attribution and share the benefits. And of course, each of these could be elaborated on in greater detail. And I'd be glad to do some of that in the Q and A. But I do want to leave time for that. One of the points, sorry, just to go back for a moment, that um, Professor Riley mentioned that I think is coming up in the global arena too, um, goes to the question of whether we're talking about individual handicrafts, uh, you know, an item that somebody might be making um, on a, a single basis, and let's say the dress or the lipo or the earrings is so labor intensive and so culturally significant and um, the raw materials that are used for it are either being you know, thrown in the form of sheep in the community and then um, shorn and woven and dyed um, with a, a whole group of people involved and then ultimately turned into a weeple. That's a process that would require years and the um, time, kind of labor, the significance of that is tremendous. Um, and then there is the fact that we live in a global economy and indigenous people themselves may seek to take advantage of that, to expand their markets, to be enjoying economic benefits as well as the dignitary benefits we've talked about. And what does that mean, I think, you know, for them um, in terms of community to be changing from a handicraft to a more um, global um, economic model and also what it mean for the law? How does the law reflect some of those norms, um, indigenous people's own customs, traditions, and values when we're talking about um, larger economies. I'll leave you with this um, slide here. One of the speakers who I found the most um, just compelling in Geneva was Abrima Eretwia, who is um, from Ghana. She comes from both um, Ghanaian indigenous origins and African-American origins in the United States. And she was so strong on the cultural expression element of her um, design work. She has a boutique in Manhattan that also runs her company in Ghana. And just telling in such an evocative way about the meaning in the villages where she either comes from or lives or works um, in um, creating symbols and signage and where the you know river is and who is the mother or the grandmother that originated this culture, uh, this, this pattern that appears on the cultural expression and how to transform that into a design that can really um, empower people today, empower people to wear their own culture, but also to share it with others. And um, the picture on the right is a Nigerian model shown in front of Nigerian ancient art. And um, I guess this brings us to the proverbial full circle moment here. Um, incredibly, this is what inspiration really is um, when it comes to indigenous people's traditional cultural expressions. And I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. That was so great. Uh, invitation extended to all of our attendees if you have any questions and you want to post them in the queue. Um, but in the meantime, we have a couple. I'd love to um, ask for all of the panelists. I'm incredibly struck by this um, observation that there's this uh, metamorphosis taking place that is more accommodating to relations. Given that we have the Indian Arts and Crafts Act in the United States, it feels like we had an early in injection of recognition of the importance of native art. And yet we also have this like simultaneous rail of the intellectual property writ large that is maybe less accommodating. I wonder if any of the speakers could talk a little bit about the proposed amendments to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act and how that is maybe reflective or not reflective of this broader metamorphosis taking place. Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in and just be really brief. Um, I, I haven't been intimately involved with the amendment, so I don't wanna 
you know, say I'm speaking from any kind of insider knowledge, just the research that I've done. You know, I think that there, there is a bit of controversy around it. And I guess, you know, one thing I just want to say, I teach art and cultural property law. And one of the things that I teach my students is that, you know, the, the work of Indigenous peoples and women often is called an art and craft rather than fine art. Um, and I think that there's a, some, there's just the culture dismisses that art when so much of it is so unbelievably amazing and rarefied and, and shouldn't be dismissed as, you know, arts and crafts. And I think that we're seeing a lot of that. But I would just say on the point that you raise, I do think that there's some controversy, especially around like non-Indian labor going into the creation of the products and what the percentage can be. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe the statute couldn't have some kind of distinctions between the kind of um, creation like Professor Re uh, Professor Carpenter talked about, um, where you're talking about, you know, like a, a rug that takes literally years when you're raising the sheep to get to the point of a finished product where you're making one a year or one every few years, as compared to someone who designs a really beautiful, amazing dress that's runway ready and wants to make a thousand of them. Um, so I'm wondering if there can't be maybe some nuance in the statute to make to show differences in that regard, because they really are very different things. But I would like to see something that encourages and supports all Native you know, creators and artisans. Thank you. Um, Professor Katyal, I learned a ton, including about the sort of like exceptions that are made for the fashion industry. Are you seeing any move to have the fashion industry but provide more protections? Is there any like conversation happening with the indigenous space or is it still treated truly as an exception? Well, I, I that's such a great question. I think I would probably distinguish it in two dimensions. I think there are has been enormous interest in um, providing greater intellectual property protections for fashion design. I think that every few years, um, Congress kind of takes um, some interest in the proposals. They haven't necessarily gone the way that fashion designers would hope, but I do think that there is increasingly um, going to be much more of a recognition of the need for um, a greater level of protection. I think in the indigenous, fashion space, I think that one of the things uh, that there are sort of two obstacles, one being uh, the kind of generalized reluctance to copyright issues of fashion design, but uh, cutting in the other direction is the um, protections that individuals um, from indigenous communities do enjoy under the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. And I think that, you know, the questions that I keep coming to when we think about these, uh, the new rounds of proposals for amendment is, uh, you know, how can we best support indigenous self-determination and sovereignty when it comes to design, when it comes to jewelry, when it comes to fashion, and how can we ensure protection for the consumer, right? Recognizing that consumers, just as Professor Carpenter points out, you know, consumers really do want designs that come directly from a community um, that they want to uh, purchase items from. So I, I think that figuring out how to kind of recalibrate that balance in a way that gives um, Indigenous tribes the autonomy to do that kind of creative work and to merchandise if necessary, but to also recognize that consumers may have very different feelings about that um, and really being thoughtful about how to kind of represent um, indigenous concerns and make sure that those concerns are, are really at the heart of what those revisions are meant to do, I think is the most important thing. Thank you. Um, Professor Carpenter, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what's happening at the WIPO with the proposed instrument um, regarding the protection of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. Given that there seems to be this transition that is happening organically, is the law keeping up and are the negotiations keeping up? Have you heard like a change in the tone of the room or are they still spinning wheels? I know that you and Professor Riley have been in the room just as much as I have. So we can all maybe share the answer to this question. But um, I, I think there are some discernible changes in the um, negotiations. 
And as you know, there are three instruments. Interestingly, and I know from Sunoe, who, you know, it's, if I go to Weibo once every five years, she's going eight times a year and like sitting through and, and leading every negotiation um, for NARP. So what I know largely comes from her, but the um, instrument on genetic resources has, as you know, been referred to diplomatic conference. And that's the, you know, space where states will actually negotiate a treaty. And given that this has been a 23 year process in which I think we've all been cynical about actually moving from discourse to an instrument, the fact that they are actually going to diplomatic conference, I, I think is a big deal. And I'd like to hope that it means that the states are um, realizing that indigenous peoples are not going to go away. They're not gonna stop um, advocating for their protection of, of these different forms of intellectual and cultural property. And maybe too, I mean, I, I'm not a markets person by any, by any um, means, but it does seem like even in the genetic resources context, um, companies are not as resistant sometimes as states to collaboration. They're actually open to innovation. And I think about the, the safeguard of free prior and informed consent, for example, from the UN declaration. And states like the United States freaked out when that was the term of the declaration. How, how are we gonna function if we have to get consent from indigenous peoples to move forward? Companies seem to understand that that provision can be um, a, a risk minimization strategy and they can work with indigenous peoples, you know, toward mutual benefit. And I, I sort of think that to the extent that states may be captured by industry and industry is whispering in their ear that they're not so afraid of these collaborations that, you know, maybe that is moving the needle, but um, I'm speculating and I'm, I'm being a little bit more hopeful than um, sometimes I feel. And I, you know, if, if you or Angela have other thoughts about the progress at WIPO, um, catching up with the times and the changing norms, I'm curious about that too. Uh, thank you so much. We had a couple questions in the queue, including regarding um, protection for state recognized tribes. My understanding is that these are part of the potential um, proposed amendments to the Indian Arts and Craft Act, but for right now, I believe protection is exclusive to federally recognized tribes, um, which is a totally separate conversation, including one that um, dominated the debate recently at the National Congress of American Indians. Um, Panelists, I can't thank you enough for an incredibly interesting presentation. We have just like a few seconds if anyone would like to offer any last uh, thoughts. Um, no, just thank you so much, Lauren. And thank you, Rue, for helping us set this up. And hi to everyone out there. Happy Native American Heritage Month and um, hope everyone is happy, safe and well. And thanks to my colleagues for making this happen. Yes, thank you. Yes, happy feast day, everyone coming up. Um, safe travels, happy families, and happy Native American Heritage Month. We will see you next.